everyone loves the tyrant dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus is the most famous dinosaur after all. Tyrannosaurus's fame has trickled down to all of its smaller or equally sized relatives, though not proportionally. This is due to the fact that trickle-down economics is pseudoscientific evil. That said, whenever a new tyrant reptile is named or published, it tends to get a lion's share of attention. I'm no better than a news cycle because I jump at the opportunity to cover them, no matter who is part of the author team. I like Tyrannosaurus too. Sue me. Anyways, a new one has just dropped, so why don't we take a gander at the deets? Mongolia has been a treasure trove of fossils and artifacts for so long that ancient people were discovering the remains of past life, human or otherwise, before the modern understanding of even something as basic as the scientific method. The vast majority of Mongolia the people outside of Mongolia see is the desert. However, it is a bit more varied than that. Mongolia also has forests, steppes, and semi-desert areas. Mongolia has also undergone lots of changes over deep time, though interestingly, it has shifted back into deserty conditions consistently over deep time as well. All that ancient history of digging in rocky outcrops in the deserted and forested areas of the country has resulted in what is essentially a library of information covering much of the Cretaceous period and many chunks of the Cenozoic era. However, there aren't enough scientists in the region to get through this library of material. Plus, a good chunk of that material was discovered by parachute scientists from the US, Canada, and Poland, or nearby countries like Russia and China. Not much can be done at this time, since getting more scientists in and from Mongolia requires raising living conditions for people there and all sorts of sociopolitical stuff I don't need to blunder my way through here. Nevertheless, new publications continue to drop based on specimens discovered many decades ago. That is, that library of discoveries I referred to earlier. Since the Mongolia fossil laws require that all specimens be repatriated to Mongolian institutions, they remain there, waiting for people to get around to working on them, lubricated by collaborations with outside institutions and their scientists. You son of a bitch. One such collaborative effort on fossil specimens known since the 1970s has been published by a multinational team, including Jared Voris, Darla Zelenitsky, Francois Therian, and Sean Modesto of Canada, Yoshitsugu Kobayashi, and Hiroki Tsutsumi of Japan, and Sogbatar Chinzorig and Kushigjev Sogbatar of North Carolina and Mongolia in the journal Nature. For the longest time, Mongolia was known to contain very few giant carnivorous theropod dinosaurs. It was just Tarbosaurus and various smaller tyrannosaurs that researchers referred to genera found only in North America, like Gorgosaurus, Albertosaurus, and Dinotyrannus, which turned out to be indeterminate theropod remains or Tyrannosaurus rex. These various North American animals found in Mongolia would go on to be lumped into Tarbosaurus, leaving just one big meat muncher. The only other carnivore, at least until the mid-1970s, was Electrosaurus. Electrosaurus was a very fragmentary genus of Tyrannosaur discovered, described, and named well before Tarbosaurus. It became a wastebasket taxon a name that is slapped onto any other fossil found from the same time and place that cannot be definitively told apart from the original. This was particularly illogical for Electrosaurus because the original specimen, in this case a syntype, is literally just one whole leg and a piece of another leg. Sure, other bits found near the original were lumped into the name, but everything is so piecemeal as to be useless. Anyways, if we time travel to the 1970s, we will see that another Tyrannosaurus specimen was discovered that would be lumped into the Electrosaurus genus. 
During the dig seasons of 1972 and 1973, a bunch of paleo nerds from Mongolia were excavating fossils in outcrops of the Bayan Chidi Formation in the Baishin Sav locality of southeastern Mongolia when they started seeing the telltale signs of two theropod dinosaurs, a very important find. Once the bones were field prepared, jacketed, and returned to a university repository, they sat for a few years before world-renowned Mongolian paleontologist Altangeril Pearl took a look at them and published a paper describing the bones. One specimen, MPC D100-51, was a few skull bones, a chunk of the left pelvis, the whole left femur, and bits of the lower leg, ankle, and foot. The other specimen, MPCD 100-50, had bits from different parts of the body, like some skull bones from the top of the skull, plus some back and tail vertebrae, the wishbone, left shoulder blade, and left toe. There are also bones from the tip of the snout, the upper jaw, cheekbone, and front half of the lower jaw, plus a hand claw that may belong to either of the two known specimens. Peril described these bones in 1977, assigning them to the already known Electrosaurus olsenii species. I told you it was a wastebasket. American paleontologists Bryn Mader and Robert Bradley then published a paper in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology in 1989, in which they took another look at the entire taxonomic history of Electrosaurus. They looked at a bunch of the specimens that were referred to the genus over the decades since the 1930s and found that almost all of them couldn't really be squared into that box. Only the very first specimens described in a 1933 paper by Charles Gilmore can be called Electrosaurus. So that means the specimens from Baishin Sav would remain in the collections of the Mongolian Academy of Sciences for several decades until Jared Voris and colleagues were in Mongolia on a trip to get a better understanding of the evolution of tyrannosaurs when they came upon them. Now armed with almost 50 more years of tyrannosaur data, the team realized that these specimens didn't belong to Electrosaurus nor any other known tyrannosaur, so they redescribed it as a new genus and species. Konkulu, Mongoliensis, which comes from Konku, meaning prince, and Lu, meaning dragon. Mongolian dragon prince has a nice ring to it, huh? When Pearl originally described these fossils in 1977, he didn't make a strong distinction between the two specimens. By that, I mean it wasn't entirely clear if he thought they belonged to the same individual or to two different individuals. Mater and Bradley also made note of this confusing circumstance in 1989. Now, in 2025, Voris and friends can confirm that both specimens belong to two individuals of the same species. Based on what was preserved of the whole body of Kangkulu, you can pretty readily tell this thing was small and gracile. What's going on here? Well, first, let's bring in everyone's favorite, Mr. Man, from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme, to see how it compares to us apes. Based on the scale bar included in the paper, Khan Kulu seems to be somewhere around 4 meters, 13 feet in length. It may have weighed around 750 kilograms, or 1,650 pounds, too. That's not particularly large, either for a dinosaur or for a tyrannosaur. Can't wait to see why. Alright, you've been great. Thank you, Mr. Man. So why is the thing so small? Is it a baby? Is it the oldest ancestor of the Tyrant Lizard King? N no, none of that actually. The author team think both critters were likely mature when they died. The usual way to determine the age of an extinct animal is to cut a thin section out of a long bone, like a humerus or femur, and put that thin section under the microscope and under different wavelengths of light. It can show you lines of arrested growth, cancers, and all sorts of weird things. The Konkulu team couldn't do this due to the condition of the fossils, so their next line of attack was what they could see on the outside of the bones. The skull bones were rather well fused together, and the nasal bone preserved a ridge of rough ornamental protuberances, which only appear in more mature tyrannosaurs. 
That is all they have for maturity at the moment, but it seems roughly strong enough. Okay, cool, so it was just that small. What about the ancient ancestor thing? When all of the anatomical traits preserved in the bones were turned into data and put into a phylogenetic software program alongside the data of a bunch of other theropod dinosaurs, including most of the tyrannosaurs, the team found that Konkulu fell right outside of the huge group that's called Eutyrannosauria, but in a bit more of an advanced position than Electosaurus. This means that Konkulu is far more evolutionarily advanced than other small-sized, slim-built tyrannosaurs were thought to be. This is also proven by their analysis spitting out the Alioramins, a group containing the long-stouted Alioramus and Shanshousaurus, as a sister group to the very last group of tyrannosaurs to exist, the Tyrannosaurans, which includes the Chinese Zhusheng Tyrannus, Mongolian Tarbosaurus, and of course, Tyrannosaurus. The Tyrannosaur family tree continues to be topsy-turvy, and this is before the rumored and accidentally leaked future publication of well over a handful of Tyrannosaurus from all up and down the US. This stuff will be just as jerky as Spinosaurus, believe you me. Konkulu comes from a layer of the Baishin Sov locality, which is part of the upper part of the Bayan Shiri formation, dating to Upper Turonian to Upper Santonian stages of the late Cretaceous. So, anywhere from roughly about 90 million to 85-ish million years ago? This is before Tarbosaurus and Alioramus existed, but also after Electrosaurus. At this time, the area that would eventually cover and fossilize the remains of Konkulu was etched by a bunch of snaky rivers, big peaceful lakes, forests, but likely also occasional arid areas. In other words, not like the Gobi Desert is today. Alongside this new grass tyrannosaur were the usual Cretaceous critters. Fish, crocs, shrew-like mammals, ashlarchid pterosaurs, and a ton of turtles. Birds likely existed, but there aren't any fossils of them yet. As for dinosaurs though, plenty have been found and described from the same formation, but maybe not the exact layer. The armored dinosaurs Amptosaurus, Malayavis, Tolerus, and Sogontegia. The hornless horned dinosaur Gracilaceratops, the hadrosaur Gobihadros, alongside a huge cache of yet to be described hadrosaurs. The dome headed Amptocephaly, Sauropod Urkatu, giant Utahraptor clone Agilobator. The swift Garudimimus, among many other ornithomimosaurs, some Ovaraptorosaurs, and a huge diversity of Therizinosaurs, including the recently named Duonicus and the well established Enigmasaurus, Erlichosaurus, and Segnosaurus. The place was happening, but it's definitely a formation that has been slow going when it comes to descriptions of all that has been found. There are a bunch of undescribed animals left to understand. That said, Konkulu offers up some new tidbits of information to add to the Tyrannosaurian story. You see, the existence of Konkulu, plus the rearrangement of the Aluramini as a sister group to Tyrannosaurini, suggests there were fewer dispersals or migrations of Tyrannosaurs between Asia and North America than previously thought, at least according to the authors. Their analysis suggests a strong likelihood that there were three major dispersal events. Asian Tyrannosaurs migrated into North America first around 91 to 86 million years ago. Then some North American forms moved back into Asia 79 to 78 million years ago. Followed by one last dispersal of the biggest, largest Tyrannosaurus line Tyrannosaurs into North America at 73 to 67 million years ago. This would overlap with the time frame of Tyrannosaurus macriensis rather well, fitting it in as a true ancestor to Tyrannosaurus rex, assuming macriensis is valid, of course. The placement of Konklu in the family tree and rearrangement of Aluramini led the research team to infer some level of paramorphosis and pedomorphosis going on in Tyrannosaurs. Paramorphosis, a type of heterochrony, is an evolutionary development in which there is accelerated or prolonged growth within a species. 
The opposite is pedomorphosis, in which there is slowed or delayed growth, usually reflected in a species retaining juvenile traits into adulthood. Those juvenile traits may be more common in juveniles of other related species or ancestral species as well. For example, we retain quite large eyes and bulbous round heads from childhood into adulthood. Sure, as adults, it's not as exaggerated as in childhood, but it's far more exaggerated than in, say, any of our ape cousins. Getting back to tyrannosaurs, this is seen in the fact that tyrannosaurines developed into giant, robust animals, paramorphosis. While the Aliuramans kept the long snouts, long skinny legs, and smaller body sizes of their juveniles, and both the juveniles and adults of their ancestors, like Konkalu, which was small and gracile into adulthood, a perfect example of pedomorphosis. Where does Nanotyrannus fit into all this? Who the hell knows? I ain't gonna touch that in this video with a 10 foot pole, thank you very much. Just enjoy the new Konkalu. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.